It's the nation's favourite antiques experts. With £200 each. I like, I like, I like. A classic car <laughs> and a gold scar Britain for antiques. The aim? To make the biggest profit at auction, but it's no mean feat. There'll be worthy winners and valiant losers. It's fine. So, will it be the high road to glory? <laughs> A slow road to disaster. Pull out the ignition. This is the Antiques Road Trip. Yeah. Today's experts, Paul Laidlaw and Kate Bliss, are winding their way through the Somerset countryside. That's rather nice. Their carriage for this trip is a classic 1967 Volvo P1800 S for super. <laughs> Okay, we're in one piece. <laughs> it's only the second leg of their road trip, but our experts are already enjoying a healthy rivalry. Just get the hammer down, sir. Get the hammer down. And Paul just about shaved a head on the first leg. Oh, well, I thought I'd let you have the first one, you know. <laughs> Lull you into a false sense of security and all that. So I got all cocky now. <laughs> Wade in deep. Yeah. I've, I've, I've got the touch. <laughs> I can do this. Kate's initial £200 has sadly shrunk to £188.14. But Paul, who began with the same amount, now has £229.24 to spend today. So, hey, you must be pretty chuffed with yourself after that auction, Mr Lee. Oh, behave yourself. Aww. That is no margin! <laughs> They kicked off their journey on the west coast of Wales before crossing into England. And they're going to head for the south coast before meandering around to Kent and finally ending up at auction in the Suffolk town of Bury St Edmunds. This leg will eventually end up at auction in Winchester, but our first port of call is the city of Bristol, otherwise known as Brizzle. Ah. The home of Isambard Kingdom Brunel's famous ship, the SS Great Britain. Today's first shop, Odds and Todds, is a joint visit. Stand by. Well done. And we're oh, here. Marvellous. Right then, say hi. Meet the natives. <laughs> Let's hope they're friendly. Ah, hello there. Good to nice see you. Nice to meet you. Hi, I'm Kate. Hi. Oh, nice Paul, to you. Yes. Good to right. see you, Les. Yeah. Can we have a little look round? Yes, you carry on. Have He's a big enough for both of us. Oh, <laughs> I don't know about that, <laughs> but I'm going that way. And I'm going in the opposite direction. <laughs> Quite right. Divide and conquer. Don't get under each other's feet. Oh, come on! Every aisle a torn! No, no, there's plenty of space for everyone. This place appears cavernous. Wow, where do you start? It's absolutely jam-packed. But very quickly, if you know what you're looking for, you can sort of filter everything in your head. And I'm already homing in on the areas where I think, potentially, there might be something for me. Somebody's bus pass. Not mine, I can assure you. What's that you found, Paul? That's an army officer, do you think? It dates to the 19th century. See the collar badges? Referred to in the army as collar dogs. I wager North or South Staffordshire Regiment. I'll tell you something else. See the knots, sometimes called Austrian knots, on the cuffs? It's not gold, it's silver. Volunteer unit. Regular army units, gilt-coloured insignia. Volunteer units, as a point of distinction, white metal fittings. That's what a lot of people deduce without having handled it. Only one way to find out more. It's a healthy layer uh, of dust on it. I think it's been there yeah, a while. Yeah, been there for a while. Expensive? 50 pounds. Oh, we're a tempter. It is Victorian, but it does have a problem. Those buttons have nothing to do with it. And they've not been stitched on. Impression. They've been put through. If you take those off, I think you're going to end up with a hole, and you're also going to end up with a big bright scarlet spot. Oh, that's frustrating. Can we think about it? OK, I'll just put that out of the way for a minute. Cheers, ladies. You're a good man. Anything else for Paul to get his mitts on? That is way more than an aluminium ashtray. It says here, made from a Rolls Royce Merlin engine piston, and this is one piston from one cylinder in a Merlin engine. And the Merlin powered Spitfires and Hurricanes during the Second World War. An interesting find. If you've ever heard one running and going past you, vroom, 
evocative beyond belief. This is the line, folks. Never in the field of human conflict was so much owed by so many to so few. There's prose for you. Who said that? That's Winston Churchill, of course. Who is he talking about? He's talking about the pilots of the Royal Air Force and Fleet Air Arm that won the Battle of Britain. And here's the punchline, the bit that sells it to me and hopefully to someone else. As used in the Battle of Britain, August, October, 1940. You want that, don't you? Oh. <laughs> Settle down, Paul. Price? 48 pounds. Les? That's got a big price tag on it. You got slack in that. 30. You 25. Thank you very much. Great. That's one in the old bag for Paul. How's Kate getting on? Do you know, in a shop like this, you've really got to squeeze into the tight spaces. And I've come into the nether regions here to see what I can spot that other people might have missed. Paperweights are, in a way, one of the best kept secrets in arts and antiques because they're such a specialist area. Now, there's two here that have caught my eye. This one shows the art of making canes in paperweight. It's a technique called mil fiore, which is from the Italian, which actually means a thousand flowers. And this technique goes way, way back, thousands of years. Now, I've spotted a date in one of those canes, 1952, and then on the other side, in one of the tiny little stars, 1977. Now, that says to me the Silver Jubilee of Her Majesty the Queen. And that, of course, is why it's been done in red, white and blue. And the other one? You've got a beautiful, organic, swirling pattern inside and a lovely colour. Turn it upside down and you've got a clear name here for Medina. Now, the Medina factory started in the 60s in Malta and was really making art glass forms for the tourist industry. I love the colour of that. It's not antique, but it's an art form in glass which has gained popularity. So I am going to go and see Les about these two. Let's keep this quiet. The ticket prices for the paperweights are £6 for the Silver Jubilee and £10 for the Medina. Hi, Les. Oh, yeah? I've just extracted these from buying your cabinets there. What could you do on these for me? I'm looking for What's something £13. OK. Is that your absolute death? <laughs> I'll do another pound twelve. 12 for the two. All right, well, I'll have a little think about that, if I may. Yes, um, that's fine. Is there anything else you could pop in with those for me, just to boost them up a bit? Is there that anything might else be a little seen? bit more value. I've seen a little Victorian glass dump weight. Let's take a squint. So this is the one I was talking about, Les, here. Dump weight, <laughs> which could be used as paper weights or doorstops, got their name because they were made from the remnants of bottle production that otherwise would have been dumped. And this one's priced at £38. Could that go in with the other two? And if so, what sort of what sort of money? What do you want to pay? What do I want to pay? It's as uh, as I, possible. Yeah, well, no, I would pay 25 Go on, then, 25 on the three paperweights. What, are you sure, Les? Yeah. Fantastic, okay, thank, thank you very much. much. Well, that's Kate off the block. Super job. There we go, Les. Thank you very much. That's thank you very for much. me. Thank you nice very much you. indeed. I'm going to put that one in my pocket. Thank you very much. Bye. Bye. Now, what's Paul up to? What a bizarre kite-like object I've spied up there. That is arguably African ethnic tribal art. But first and foremost, it's a lifesaver, because that's a shield. His distinctive form allows me to tell you it comes from the Sudan. I think the southern Sudan, the Taposa people. And they have these hide shields with wings, top and bottom. Call them seraphs. It's authentic in its construction and it appears to have some age to it. Is there a market for it? Absolutely. Do I want it? Oh, yes. Do I know what it's priced at? There's some sort of faded label on the bag. Let's find less than less. Ninety-five pounds. No, I'll tell you what. Here you we can do. make me offer. Let's have a conversation as well, right? And I'll get out your hair. See the uniform that we looked at. Yeah. That thing, because someone has put holes in the front of it, is ruined. But it's got some badges on it, so it's of some interest still to someone. Yeah. I'm offering you twenty quid for the uniform and twenty quid for the shield. Okay. What can you do? £40 on the uniform. If you take 20 quid for the shield? £40 on the shield. 
that's less than half price. Well, you do 70 quid the pair. 75 pound, and that's it. 75 quid, is it? Cheers. Amazing. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Now I've got to get that down. <laughs> <laughs> so, that's £100 for the piston ashtray and the army tunic and the tribal shield. A wonderful shall set on my debts. £20, £80, £100. Thank you very much. Yes, thank you. It's a busy day. Absolute pleasure. See you next time. Meanwhile, Kate has made her way to the Clifton area of Bristol. She's meeting Laura Hilton, manager of the Clifton Bridge Visitor Centre. So here we are. Wow, look at that. Yeah. Oh, it certainly catches the wind up here. Yeah, just a little bit, doesn't it? <laughs> that is a phenomenal view, isn't it? And the bridge yeah. just looks really majestic laid out below you, doesn't it? This iconic bridge, spanning the Avon Gorge, has connected Bristol to North Somerset since 1864. And so you've got Bristol all that way. Yeah, you can see practically the whole of the city from mm -hmm. up here. It was designed and built by the famous 19th century engineer, Isambard Kingdom Brunel. But 20 years before construction started on this bridge, a local woman, Sarah Guppy, made her own grand plans to span the Avon Gorge. So this wasn't particularly encouraged in women at the time, was it? We're talking the late Georgian period, aren't we? I mean, women really were expected to sit and sew and play the piano and be very social. Yes, that's right. So at this time, women really were expected to, to be the wife, be the mother, look after the household um, in high society, to be a social act, to throw parties, to entertain people, to really just help to promote their husband and, you know, entertain his business contacts. Sarah Guppy would not be constrained by the conventions and etiquettes of the time, and the death of a local merchant might have been the catalyst for her bridge designing. In 1754, a man called William Vick left a thousand pounds in his will to build a toll-free stone bridge across the Avon Gorge, and this is really the beginning of the story here. 17 years later, Sarah designed and patented a bridge for crossing the Avon Gorge. Although the design was submitted by a female, it didn't stop expressions of interest in a local newspaper. The plan invented by Mrs Guppy of Bristol appears to be capable of being performed expeditiously. As soon as a subscription is set on foot for such a bridge, I intend setting down my name for 50 or 100 shares. Unfortunately, Sarah Guppy's bridge was never built. There was a major issue with the positioning of the bridge. Uh, Sarah had designed something that would work at water level. The Admiralty had a decree that all bridges must be over 110 feet high so that ships, warships, in times of trouble, would be able to leave port quickly and get out to sea. Unlike Guppy's bridge design, the Clifton Bridge was built high above the gorge. Although there is no evidence to suggest that Brunel was influenced by Sarah Guppy's design, she did have ties to him. So we know that Sarah Guppy was good friends with the Brunels, and in fact, Sarah Guppy's son, Thomas Guppy, ended up working with Isambard Kingdom Brunel on the Great Western Railway and two of his ships, the SS Great Western and the SS Great Britain. However, Sarah Guppy did leave an engineering legacy in her own right. So Sarah and her first husband were in America and they discovered there a technology for shipping, barnacle repellent nails, um, and they purchased this invention, improved on it, brought it to the UK and patented it. Then they sold it to the Royal Navy for £40,000 and in today's equivalent that would be millions of pounds. Sarah Guppy had broken one taboo, the female sex being involved in engineering design. She also found a solution for another, how Georgian ladies could keep fit because for women to exercise in public, it was very much frowned upon at the time, wasn't it? Well, of course, she couldn't exactly put on her jogging pants and go out round Clifton. Her invention was ahead of its time. If you imagine a four-poster bed that then turns into a multi-gym, it had pull-up bars, it had steps in it, it meant the women in the privacy of their own homes could get fit. So this is a little private gym, essentially. <laughs> Although there are sketches of Sarah Guppy's designs, we sadly don't know what the great lady herself looked like. There are no known images of her. After the death of her first husband, Sarah was beset with misfortune. She married again. Her second husband was a gambler, and because he had access to the bank accounts, all of that money that she'd accumulated from her patents 
just got gambled away. What a sad story, but how nice that we can look back today yes. and recognise her achievements. Yes, and I think if she were alive today, she would be a very well-respected engineer with a great yeah. career. Meanwhile, Paul has made his way to the stunning city of Bath, famous for its seven crescents. He's visiting his second shop. Is that Alex? Yes. Good to see you. Hello, Paul. This is off the wall. It certainly is. It gives some first impression, I'll give you that. Thank you. So, have a mooch, find something, come back and see you. Yeah. Have an explore. Seems like a plan, we'll do it. Yeah, see you in a bit. See you in a bit. Anything tickle your fancy? A pair of little child's moccasins, surely. Buckskin, a bit of cotton, a bit of plush velvet, and glass beads. The label says, Iroquois, Native American people. And a sophisticate can pin down from the patterns and styles of the beadwork and so on, what part of America such pieces come from very highly collectible, but of course, still being made today. So what do we look for? Well, the first thing is, what are they made of? Any nylon or synthetic threads in there, all natural materials. I put it to you that they're probably 19th century and certainly no younger than the early 20th. Price, all of 68 pounds. Frankly, I've sold these for three and a half thousand pounds a pair, but they were early and fine and super. They don't sound dear at 68 pounds. Worth a punt. One possible. Moving on though, what else? I spotted this earlier, but I feel lazy being tempted by it. Pray tell all. Because this wouldn't be the first time I'd bought such a thing. No, it isn't. And as you know, it's not just any old ashtray. Because this stone is stone recovered from the Houses of Parliament. The Houses of Parliament were bombed during the Blitz and during their reconstruction work, some Breisberg came up with the idea, rather than throwing that stone away, make things from it and sell those objects in need of war charities. This is one such. This cast lead plaque here shows the clock tower. This stone came from the Houses of Parliament. I love that. I'd prefer it if it wasn't another ash tree. I'd prefer it with bookends, paperweights, but at £26, a profit in that auction and I should buy it but I've done it before and it's put me off I don't want to be samey and boring hardly likely to do that a couple of wee things that I'm half interested in and okay. see if there's any slack in your price the moccasins right well, I've got 68 on them I could come down a little bit help you out okay about 55 it's not enough but it's reasonable the other thing one house of commons Ashtray. Yep. 26 pounds. In yep. Interesting item. Yeah. Well, we could do a little bundle okay. price. Yeah. 50 and 20. So 70 altogether. OK, I'm going to make you an offer. 60 for the two. I can do that. Yeah, we can shake on 60. You've done it then. Gentlemen, Alice. So? You're welcome. A hell of a place. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> and you're two wee things lighter now. That's 40 pounds for the moccasins and 20 pounds for the ashtray. Great. That settles my debts. Thanks very much. Pleasure. All the best. That concludes today's shopping for our duo. Sheep lying down, that means rain. No, it doesn't. Cows lying down means rain. Nighty night. Well, a lovely morning for it. Just no sheep turning up. The sun's wanting to crack open. Yeah. On the shopping front, I've... Mm. Let's put it this way, I've got plenty of money left. <laughs> you certainly have, Kate. After buying that big old dump and the other two, you've got £163 left to spend. How about you? You spent lots? Uh, oh, I've spent a good deal back of what I had. Oh, have you? No, that you did, Paul. But you landed the ashtrays, the officer's coatee, the African shield and the moccasins. And you've got £69 left to spend. I mean, I would never have found that thousand pound lot for 150 yesterday if I'd have given up. Get out of here, <laughs> Mr. Laidlaw. You're probably double bluffing me. <laughs> I so wish, kid. I so wish. Our experts have headed for the coast. 
That is Not the scene. Prospect. Look at that. Yes. Oh. Today, Kate is dropping Paul off in a rather windswept Western Superman. I don't care how cold it is, I'm getting a nice steam. <laughs> good luck. Have a good one. See you Bye. later. The town is famous for its two piers. Sadly, only one, the Grand, is still in use today. Paul's next stop is Violet Antiques. Sounds fragrant. Where's Violet? Here we go. Hi, Paul. Angie, good to see you. And you. What a nice neck of the woods. Yeah, it's not bad, is it? Yeah, not and this, uh, this feels good. It's good, you like it. Yeah. I'll have a wee rummage. Yep. Come and see. You're being watched, Paul. The Vikings looking a wee bit, uh, <laughs> no sure about it. How are you doing? <laughs> Down boy. Introduction's over, time to get back to work. And what's caught Paul's eye so quickly here? A watercolour? I shouldn't buy a picture. I don't think you should buy pictures or furniture. No. What? No, because I do well with them. Do you? <laughs> yes, do you? I do, yeah. But uh, you, you, you retail, you create your mm. environment at auction, it's harsh. Yes. Still tempted though, aren't you? I quite like. That's nice. It's a good work. Mm. You've got to look past the 50s frame. Oh, yes. And see that in a fabulous mm. period gilt frame, and it's a nice watercolour. Mm. Yeah, it appears to be by David Cox, the influential 19th century watercolourist from Birmingham. But can that be cheap or not? Hey, you don't beat about the bush, do you, Paul? It's got a ticket price of £105. I have had it a little while. So, okay. um, 40. You'd be selling that for 40 quid? I'd buy it for 40 quid. Deal. I've done it! <laughs> <laughs> but a breath ago I said, don't buy paintings! You've done it now. <laughs> I get that. I have done it now. I've bought a painting. There we are, we do. You made me a bit of space now. I haven't a gist. Thank you very much. Thank I've you, had Paul. fun before. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. And I hope it does well for you. I'll take the luck. Thank you. <laughs> Bye. See ya. Let's leave Paul to enjoy the sea air in Western. Kate, meanwhile, has made her way through the beautiful Somerset countryside and is headed for the town of Cheddar, renowned for the cheese of the same name. Mmm, tasty. Her next stop is the rather jauntily named Ain't Too Proud to Browse. Hello there. Oh, hi. Hi, you must be Jules. Yeah, I'm Jules. Great hi, to, nice meet to meet you. you. This is like a TARDIS in here, isn't it? Yeah, 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 it certainly is. I'll have a mooch. Yeah, have Thank a you. Yeah. Hey, look at this. Now, I bet this has seen some action. It only just fits in here under the eaves. It's so long. So it's made of coffer and it's known as a coaching horn because its use was to announce the arrival of a coach when it came into a busy town. And the coachman would simply put this to his lips and blow a warning signal. And it would basically say, get out of my way. Now, the ticket price on this is £35. It's a fair retail price. It's obviously seen some action. It's got some wear, a few dints, but it's got its nice brass mouthpiece there. Should we give it a go? <laughs> Bravo, Kate. Not bad. Still working. Hey, this is great up here. What a lovely building. Now, I've just spotted in here a nice little pin dish. And it's very distinctive, actually. You can see that dark blue glaze and then the lovely flower on top. If I run my fingers over the pattern, you can feel that the detail here is raised. And that's what's known as tube lining. And if you turn it over, you can see the name Moorcroft and that factory was one of the best at it. Now, Moorcroft has really been a buoyant market in recent years. It's just starting to go down a little bit, but pin dishes like this are still really commercial. So I think this is worth a chat. Ah, Hi. just the man. Hi. Yes. <laughs> you found something. I have. Oh, I found right. this in, a, in one of your cupboards upstairs. Mm -hmm. What could you do for me on that? It sports a ticket price of £40. I think we could go down to 20 20 OK. And if I said I'll take the coaching horn as well... And there's 35 on that. Could you chuck that in and say 30 for the for the two? Uh, 
Oh, How's about sounds? 35? Or 30. can you stretch to that? Could you do 32? 32. Meet you in the middle? Yeah. Yes? Deal. Great. Deal. That works for me. Let me give you some money. Oh, I couldn't resist it. I know I need lessons. Yeah. On the coaching horn. There we go. And there's the two. Thank you so much. Oops. Lovely. There we go. That's Wonderful. for you. Great. Thank you so much, Kate. Now, yeah, the question is, you. will it go in the car? Neatly done, Kate. <laughs> Meanwhile, Paul's found himself in the town of Bridgewater. He's come to hear the much-forgotten story of a local man credited as the father of the modern Royal Navy and to find out why so little is known about him. Fortunately, David Seaborn is an expert on General at Sea Robert Blake. I get Drake in the Tudors and I get Nelson in the Napoleonic, but I'm, I'm lost in the middle. Tell me more. Well, the one man that stands out in the 17th century is Robert Blake, General at Sea. It was largely due to Blake that the Navy became organised in the way that it was. So was Blake a naval man from his youth? Oh no, absolutely not. He became a very effective soldier in the Civil War. An army soldier? He's fighting on the land? He was an army man. So which side was he on? Oh, very much on the parliamentarian side. Most famously, he defended Taunton for off and on 10 months against three royalist attacks. This was what made him a, a bit of a, a national hero at that stage. Blake's success on land was duly noted. He's almost out of the blue, uh, appointed general at sea. There were three generals at sea, um, uh, and he was the leading one. It was hoped Blake could transform the fortune of the Navy. The parliamentary authorities wanted to see military discipline uh, in the Navy, and the Navy were an ill-disciplined lot. A vice admiral had defected to the Royalists, and they, they suspected the loyalty of, the, of, of their admiral, um, but they could trust the army. A whole lot of new regulations come out, uh, lists of things that uh, are not to happen. Can you give me some examples? Anything from stealing to spying, from cowardice to sleeping on duty. Um, and for most of these, the, the punishment was death. My word. This is what Blake did. He instilled discipline into the Navy. Blake took part in several campaigns at sea, being badly wounded during one. However, it would be his actions against the Spanish merchant fleet that would cement his place in naval history. They hear news that the Spanish treasure fleet has anchored uh, in the Canary Islands um, at Santa Cruz de Tenerife, and this was what Blake was good at. Naval operations against land targets or ships at anchor. The English fleet sail into Tenerife, and by the end of the day, all the Spanish ships were either burning or on the bottom. So Blake was triumphant against the Spanish at Santa Cruz to Tenerife, although he was losing his own battle with wounds inflicted during earlier campaigns. By that time, Blake knew he was dying. Blake's one last wish was to be able to die on English soil. Cromwell gave Blake permission to return home. And as the ships come up to the sound, he dies, breathes his last. So he never did get his last oh, wish. What? Although robbed of his dying wish, Blake did receive a state funeral. David, why did I not know this story before today? Because three years after he's been buried as a national hero in Westminster Abbey, the king is restored to the throne, and for political reasons, all the great achievements of the Commonwealth period were airbrushed out of history, because they were republicans after all. Though the royalists were keen for us to forget all about Blake, his memory still lives on today. This is very special and we're, and we're very proud of it. Blake's sea chest. His very own? His very own sea chest. So this I could call 17th century campaign furniture. Indeed. Would you like to see inside? Uh, may we? Oh, my word. It's not simply a, a chest or trunk. It, it's a secretaire, it's his desk. It's a mobile office. What a piece of furniture. And this would have been on the ship upon which he died approaching England. Yes. 
Blake may well have been forgotten down the centuries, but the fighting force he helped create would continue to be renowned around the world. But in an ironic twist of history, this Republican's beloved Navy would eventually come to be known as the Royal Navy. Let's catch up with Kate in the Somerset countryside. Now, I've got three lots under my belt. I haven't spent a great deal of money on any one lot. So from that point of view, I'm sitting quite pretty, but I would like to get something of really good quality if I can. Fingers crossed then, Kate. Lemon Tree Antiques is in the quaint village of Blackford. Hello there. Hello, Kate. <laughs> How are you? Hey, great, Nice thanks. to see you. This is quite a place you've got here. Yes, it'll take yeah. you a little while to look around. That it will. Les has got lots of goodies in here. Is it all right if I have a bit of a mooch? Yes, of course. Now, we've got a real mix in this stick stand of walking sticks, but what's caught my eye is this parasol or umbrella, if you like. And it's the handle, actually, in these parasols, which is often the most commercial piece. And here you can see we've got some lovely gilt decoration here. Very elegant, obviously a lady's piece. And you've just got, got a little bit of raised scroll work there to give you a little bit of detail and decoration. But here's the treat. If you open it up... Careful, don't jinx your visit. It's bad luck to open it all the way. Like so many things. Look at that. So you've got some lovely embroidery work there inside. Beautiful coloured silks, all in really nice condition. But you've got an outer coating as well to keep the showers away. I think this is probably post-war. The handle looks French and possibly a little bit earlier. I think that's worth a punt at the right money. But I'm going to tuck it back for now. That's what they all say, Kate. Oh, now have a look at this. Now, brass isn't something that I would normally go for. And in fact, it has suffered a little bit of decline in the marketplace. But this is interesting because you've got quite a good set here. Pair of fire dogs, as they're called, matching the fire dogs. You've got your fire arms, your poker, your tongs, and of course, your shovel. And these are very much in the Georgian style. I've got a set at home that I still use with the wood burner. So they're still actually very practical items. Les, are you about? How can I help? <laughs> you've got some great stuff in here. But most of it, I have to tell you, is unfortunately out of my price range. But I have landed on this set of brass firearms and the dogs there. It's a, it's a good set, isn't it? But I can't see a ticket price. What are you looking for on that? Well, that's only just come in, Kate, and we haven't actually put a price on it. Right. We were going to put £100 on it. Mm, what could you do? A little bit better? You rascal. Just for me? How about 75 quid? <sighs> I have seen a little parasol just around the corner, tucked in your stick stand. What would be your best uh, if I took the parasol as well? 75 quid. I can't go any more than 70. Is that okay. any good for you? Oh! <laughs> good Huge man! Driver. I knew you'd see sense. 70 quid. Let's give you some cash. Yeah. That's for you. you. Now, I've got to stagger hand. out with this. I'll give you a hand, dear lady. Brilliant. Ah, oh, who says the age of chivalry is dead? Oh, I mustn't forget me brolly. Definitely not. No. It's just cost you £10 and you paid 60 for those fire dogs. Time now to find Mr Laidlaw. I do like this car. It has a sort of understated style, yeah. just like yourself. Quite. <laughs> <laughs> now time for some shut-eye. Good morning from the beautiful city of Winchester. Well, this is rather smart. Isn't it just? Wealthy clients. That's what we need, big bidders. Come on. It's the end of our experts' West Country wander. They started their journey in Bristol before sauntering through Somerset and ending up in Hampshire. And it's Bellman's Winchester cell room, which is our final destination for this trip. Paul bought five lots for £200. And Kate also bagged five lots but for £127. So what do our Kate and Paul make of each other's booty? This does shouts, Paul Laidlaw, does it not? Yes, sir. 
so that this jacket doesn't get lost in the sale room, he's bought the dummy. So this is beautifully shown off to fulfil its potential. That is the Laidlaw marketing machine that I am up against. I've got a sweat on. That's scary. £25? I think you could arguably pay £25 each for those and think you've done well. Auctioneer Jonathan Pratt has cast his eye over our experts' lot. Go, JP. David Cox is a very well-known artist from the early 19th century. There are lots and lots of fakes of David Cox. We have to be very careful when we sell this. We think it's right. Sadly, it's not going to go flying away because the market just isn't strong enough for Victorian watercolours. Moorcroft pin dishes is a pretty safe bet. It depends how well she's bought it, of course, but it's a nice quality thing. It's a modern collectible. Uh, I would have thought certainly 30 to 50 pounds. With the things they bought today, I think we'll do just, just fine. Fingers crossed then, and it's standing room only. Pretty packed room, I would say. It's very genteel, Louis. No garden arms. Or no arms. First up, can Paul smoke a profit out with his ashtrays? I was quite happy with my military ashtray wand. When I bought them, sitting here now, is the one I'm most worried about. I've got £40 on commission to start. We're going to get £40, looking for £5. Now. Actually, that's better than £40. Pounds, any interest at £45. 40 45 internet 50 with me. Again, it's £50 against you, internet. Do I need 65 60 with me? Against you, 60 internet. 65 70 with me, still £70 on commission. It's 75 80 on commission, still at £80. Against you, 80 internet. £85 internet, and I'm out now, it's £85. Is there 90 on the net now? £90 now on the net, still going at 90 and selling £90 all done. Pulls off to a scorcher. <laughs> what do I know about Astrid? <laughs> Kate's pinning her hopes on her first lot. Straight away at £15 on commission. 15 on commission. Look at it. 20, 25. 30 at the back yes. of the room. 35. 40. Do. 45. 50. <laughs> 55. That's not bad 60 at all. by the bed. 65 with a lady. 70 with a gentleman waving. Ladies out. 75 on the net now. It's going to go one more, sir. 80 in the room. That's it gets to internet. Nice. It's £80. In the room, then, your bid, sir. £80. Croft down here. That's a stonking profit for Kate. Well, come on, I had to catch you up. And boy, did you. <laughs> Next, will Paul walk away with the profit for his moccasins? I've got £15 to start on commission. Looking for 20 now. 20, 25 with in the ring. 30, and I'm out now. Standing at £30. 35 internet bid now. It's in. £35. Any more at £35? Anyone else want to join in? They're a bit small, but they're comfy. <laughs> it's £35. <laughs> Do you want to go one more? Go one more. Okay, one more. One more. £40 pounds in the room. Yeah, £40 pounds in the room. Didn't take much to convince him. It's £40. Pounds. Fair warning. Thank you. Well, you can't win them all, Paul. Not a big step by quite, but no flyer either. You are Mr Positive, aren't you? <laughs> Kate's paperweights are next. I'm not sure whether I've done the right thing putting all these together. I absolutely hope it was the wrong thing to do. <laughs> <laughs> what, what? 25, 35, 45 on the commission at 45. That's I'll take 50 right. those. Who's got four, 55 with me? 60 behind at the back, 60 oh, pounds, and I'm out now at 60. 65 on the net, 70 still hand in the air at 70 now. Against your internet, 70. 75, 80 bits, 85, 90. You say no. Can't convince you? Can I convince you? Oh, you're thinking about it. 90. He's 90 good. pounds against your internet, 90. 95 on the net. It's a definite no this time. £95, fair warning. What can I say? Another great showing. What a race. That's not bad. Will Paul's African Shield turn a profit? I've got 25 to start, £25. Look at the 30 now. 30, 35 with me, internet. 40, 45 with me. Oh, please don't move. 50 on the net now, and I'm out now. It's on the net 50. 55. Any more? Fifty-five pounds then it's on the net. Fly either, is it? It's just going to make me a little bit. Fifty-five pounds ourselves. Fair warning. It's all right, yeah. That's profit, I isn't it? Mind, all right. So it's an insult. Every little bit helps, though. I don't want the ethnographic profits. I want the macro profits. Give me it all. Will Kate leave Paul in the shade with her parasol. <laughs> Twenty-five with me. Look at the thirty. Thirty on the net. Don't go quiet. Thirty-five with me. Forty and five with me. Nice. 45 pounds. 50 and 5 again with me on commission at 55 pounds. Commission at 55 pounds. At 55. Anyone else joining in the room? 60 on the net now, and I'm out now at 60 pounds. And selling on the net 60. 
That's all right. Uh, it's all right. I say it's all right. It's not all right. Wow, it looks like Kate's got the Midas touch today. Come on, I'm wrong. No, I shouldn't say that. Touch wood, touch wood. Paul catch up with his watercolour. Commission here, twenty pounds. I have okay, twenty-five, gonna be thirty. It's worth a pound. Thirty pounds against you, internet. Thirty-five and forty. I have against you, forty pounds. Still with me, forty. It's a break even. Pounds. You don't break even. It's going. Five pounds. Anyone else now? Forty-five pounds. Nice little colour. Selling to the net, forty-five. Okay. Five. Fair. Took a punt. Didn't get one. A small faded profit. Oh, I could have done with some glory though. I peaked with the ashtray. I did. I never have predicted that. How about Kate's far dogs and art? At 20, maybe mid 20. Oh, no. at 20. Oh, come on. 25, that's it. I'm out now. It's on the net at 25 pounds. 30, I'll take. Any other bids in the room? Come, come on. on. 30, thank you. In the room. Surely one more. 35. Come on. Yes, yes. Th <laughs> there we are. Go on. Creeping. 40 pounds. It gets oh. you to 40 now. Are you really sure? One for luck. Do you want to ask the wife? <laughs> no? It's 45 pounds. And come selling on. on the net now, 45. Fair warning. Be my big man. <laughs> Well, you win some, you lose some. Not in fashion at the moment, maybe. Well, thank goodness, <laughs> thank goodness. So can Paul finish with a flourish? £30 to start with me at 30. 35 internet, 40 again with me. 45, I'm out now. It's 45 on the net, 50 behind. In the room now, 50. 55. Okay, 60 so they don't the mind the dust. Against your internet, 60. 65. 70 in the room. In the room at 70. Against you internet 70. In the room then, the gentleman's been 75. I'm not unhappy at that. 80 pounds in the room again. 80 pounds against you. I'm happy, I know. 85. 90 in the room. 90 pounds against you. 95. Going into the moth hole. 100. Shall I announce? In the room. Again, 100 against you internet 100 pounds. 110. He's out now. 110 pounds. Are you sure, sir? One more. Yes, sure. Last chance at 110. Thank you. <laughs> Good price. Bravo, Paul. That's a brilliant profit. Nicely done. With military, I just can't compete. <laughs> oh, you're right. It was all about military. It was Spitfires and Scarlet Coaties. Finally, it's the coaching horn. It works, I can tell you. <laughs> it does. Um, 20 pounds to start with me at 20 pounds. Look for five now. It's 25, 30 with me. Against you, internet 30. At 30 pounds. Hail a taxi with it. 30 pounds. <laughs> <laughs> He's playing hard. He did. I'll take that. And Kate ends on a profit too. Well done. We did it, okay. I'd come here again. I'll see you then. Let's go and get some air. Paul started the day with £229.24. After auction costs, he made a profit of £78.80. And he ends the day with £308.04 to spend on the next leg. Kate started the day with £188.14. After her auction costs, she made a profit of £127.20, which leaves her with £315.34 to spend next time. And that great profit sees Kate edging ahead on the second leg. Hey, well, that was good fun. Oh, what? High benchmark <laughs> set there, sun shining. I Results. know.